is. And if you don't understand that, you will quit praying and think right. that everything's over and right. it is nowhere near over. Amen. Nowhere near over. Now, in light of that then, we want to go into the message today. I, I will make one other statement that I will refer you back to. I'll refer you back to those of you who have been attending. I tell you, if you don't come on Mondays and Thursdays, you miss things many times, particularly since it's live streamed. No reason not to unless something is happening at your home or wherever. But we gave out uh, Enoch, what Enoch had to say, uh, pertaining from the book of Enoch. And, and I would not kind of, I wouldn't poo-poo uh, Enoch if I were you. There's only been two people that have been taken up to heaven. Enoch is one of them, the first one, the only one who walked with God and was taken by God himself because of his righteousness and who he was. You know, I, I laugh every time I think about this, so there are only two old people in heaven, <laughs> Enoch and Elijah, yeah. Yeah. because they are still in their earthly bodies. Come on, church, we don't want to play dumb. We don't want to play dumb. Spiritual things and the Word of God is far more real than anything in this, in this world. But anyway, so when Enoch says something in his book, and just because it wasn't included in the original canon, I talked about this before. You know, there are lots of books that were not included. They're part of, a, a, a part of the Bible called the Apocrypha now. You can get it. But... Uh, uh, it, it's just a little baby things that kept them out of man who decided what to put this one in and leave that one out and whatever. But Enoch is referred to in, the, in, in, in our Bible several times. And so I would not ignore Enoch by any means at any point, any circumstance. So you have tools in your hands. I don't know whether or not you've got the Word of God and you hear the, the Word of God that comes true and then you've got in your hands... Uh, uh, what has been said by uh, men and women of God. I'm talking about out of the Bible, not only all, uh, around the world. So that's, that's enough to say about all that. But are you with me? To go back and study uh, the words that you have in your hand to look at and say, well, I'm not going to pay much attention to that because it's not in my King James. Well, slide the papers in your King James. <laughs> then it will be in your King James. Hallelujah. Because it is worthy of a place. So, glory to God. Today, I want to talk to you about what it means to be a friend of God. What it means to be a friend of God. There is a song that we used to sing, and it has something, it says something about being a friend of God in it. And on, on several occasions, I, I had commented, I, I don't know why I don't really like that song. And, and, and I now know why I, 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 I didn't. Just me, personally, uh, I, I think I'll like it after today <laughs> uh, and after I have learned some things. But I kept wondering, why, what is it about that song that strikes some kind of note in me that makes me... Do any of you know what I'm talking about, that, that song, whatever it is? I can't, I can't remember the name of the thing. I am, am I what? I am a friend of God. That's what it says. Well, I guess... Uh, well, it, I'll explain as we go along. But there was something that would hit wrong as, as, as the whole church would sing, get so caught up being a friend of God and all that kind of thing. And there's truth in it. There's truth in it. But something about it would bother me. And, and uh, I didn't know why it bothered me. But this message answered it for me. Amen. So um, uh, maybe it never even bothered you. And if so, obviously I'm the only one that had a problem. So that would be kind of unusual. It's kind of like the only one. Well, let me, don't go there. All right. <laughs> No, no, go there. Okay. So what it means to be a friend of God. When you read and study the Bible and all the various men and, women, men and women that are in the Bible, the Word of God, there is only one person, only one person in the entire Bible that is called a friend of God. One person. And that happens to be Abraham. He is the only one that is named, called by God his friend, and referred to as the friend of God. Not David, not Enoch, not Elijah, not Daniel, 
Not John, Peter, Paul, you know, Matthew, Luke, none of them are called friend of God, except, now I know there's some New Testament scriptures, I'm, not, I'm talking about a direct call being friend of God, called by God, my friend, the friend of God. So what is it about Abraham? What is it and his relationship with God that would make the word of God say that he is a friend of God? I'm going to do my very best to tell you why, and it even has to do with where we're living today, and it has to do with today. So I think you're going to be amazed. I do know this. When I began studying and the Lord began speaking, I thought, I want to be a friend of God. <laughs> I want to, to really meet his criteria that he would call me a friend of God. And, and uh, so when, when I began to go through the scripture, there are, there are four distinct things that, that make you fall into that category that God looks at before he would actually call you a friend of his are called a friend of God. Now in the, uh, we have gotta go through the summary kinda of Abraham's life for a minute for you to get the real understanding of this. Uh, in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, uh, will take you through 2,000 years of history, 11 chapters, 2,000 years of history. You go through creation, Noah, the flood, and you go to the Tower of Babel. All of that happens within 11 chapters of Genesis. Then when you get to chapter 12 in Genesis, the Bible then begins to focus on four individuals, and that continues for 38 chapters, just four people. So if we review Abraham's uh, life, let's look at, uh, don't worry, we're not going to read the entire book of Genesis, all 38 or uh, 11 chapters, but chapter, let's look at, go to chapter 12 in Genesis, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you and I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. What a word from God. What a word from God. Well, in here we find out, we see something that is kind of amazing to me that I had not paid any attention to before. It says, now the Lord had said to Abram. So this is not the first time God had talked to him. So he obviously had been called by God much earlier because it says, had said. You can look in your own Bible and see it says that. But he waited. He waited until his father died and before he actually answered the call of God. And then when he left uh, 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 his uh, harem, when he left there, he started, he followed the Lord at the age, he started following him at the age of 75. That's encouraging to some of us, hallelujah. <laughs> he took his wife, he took his nephew. I don't know if you've ever paid attention how many people started with the major event of their life after they were 75 or 80 years old. Most of the people that we honor the most in, in, in the Old Testament, that is true of. It, it's, it kind of, you know, rattles your cage a little bit. There's hope, hallelujah. Anyway, so when he left, he took his wife, he took his nephew, Lot. Now, he was not told to bring all Lot with him, but he took Lot, all of their possessions, and more than 300 servants when he went on this journey to Canaan. And then uh, the Lord, you know, again appears here in chapter 12 and uh, again uh, uh, tells them the same kind of promise again. So what happened? Let's just quickly go through it. Immediately after he began to go to Canaan, he ran into a famine, if you remember. Uh, and so he goes off to Egypt. And when he goes to Egypt looking for food, uh, Father Abraham, Father of Faith Abraham, and, you know, sometimes it makes you feel good that somebody who's so powerful and known as Father of Faith and all of that does something quite crazy like you do. Amen. I mean, don't you like, I mean, you, you know, forgive us, Lord, that we like to see flaws. Come on, let's be a little real today. Okay, all right. You know, I've learned with God, if you'll be really real with him, he'll be really real with you, you know. So I, I was kind of glad to see it, to be honest. So it says, 
you know, so he goes down uh, with the Egyptians, and then he was concerned because Sarah was so beautiful. Now, remember, now, Sarah was 65. She was still beautiful like we are. <laughs> Hallelujah. She was still beautiful. Thank you, brother. I'll send you something. <laughs> so anyway, so, so he convinces Sarah to, you know, to, to lie for him and tell, tells her, you know, so she won't, she's just too pretty. He thinks that they're going to capture her, and so he gets Sarah to lie, to lie. And so, again, we see a little, little problem here with his faith when he started off, you understand. Okay. Then when he comes back from Egypt, he comes back with someone really extra, a young woman named Haggai. Hagar, I mean, Hagar. Hagar came with him. Now, that wasn't so hot. We do know what happened with Hagar. So she's Sarah's servant girl. You know what happens there? A lot of trouble came on because of that little gift. Hallelujah. And so Abram and Lot, if you remember, they returned from Egypt. They were wealthy. They were wealthy when they went, but they're more wealthy when they came back out of Egypt. I mean, they, they had so much wealth, they couldn't even continue to stay, stay together in the same place. So then we end up, Abram and his humility. He says, okay, we got to divide. We both are too rich, got too much. We all can't just travel together. And he, you know, he, he said, we got to choose where we're going to settle and etc." And you remember Lot did, did what most of us would do who's younger than he is. And, you know, all, the young people always think they're more wiser than the old. And so what did he do? He just chose the best land that there was and left, you know, Father Abraham over here, whatever. Of course, he just didn't understand that God was with Abraham. Just a little, little thing he forgot. But anyway, it was at this point, after Lot had left him, that the Lord spoke to him and renewed his covenant with him. That's Genesis 13, 14 through 17. This is 13, okay. And it said, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, now lift up your eyes. See, that's a kind of an indication there. Of course, he didn't tell him to take Lot. So when we got Lot out of the picture, God begins to talk a little more. <laughs> Now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land which you see I'm going to give to you and to your descendants forever. So sometimes thereafter, there was a war with the kings, if you remember. They, you know, Lot goes down close to Sodom and Gomorrah, remember all that. So there were war with the kings and Lot and his entire family being, got captured. And then Abraham and his group, Abram and his group went with his 318 servants. They go and they capture and he goes back, and with all the four or five kings, I've forgotten how many there were, nevertheless, he goes and defeats all of them. You remember? Yes. And on his way back, I mean, he gets a lot back and all that kind of stuff. Then he met Melchizedek on the way back, and to whom he gave his tithe. That's where we see the, the, the tithe being given. After that, the Bible says that the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, that's Genesis 15:1. Genesis 15:1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Now, I think we should pay attention to the things that Abram did along it. He gave a tithe. I mean, that could make, wake up somebody. He, you know, he gave a tithe. And after it was after the tithe was given that this little word came, came in here about the great reward and what God's going to do for him. And then he says, you know, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Well, what was Abraham going to be afraid of? Well, all them kings, that they could come back after him. Remember, he did not live in a wall city. He lived in a tent. Amen. Hello, church. So he's telling him, don't, you know, don't get shook up over this. And then uh, Abram then reminds God that he has no heir, you know. And so he suggests that his chief servant, you know, will be his heir. But the Lord said, no, 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 no. And uh, Genesis 15, 4, uh, the Lord addresses that issue. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body. He will be your heir. I mean, the Lord begins to say strange things in, in, in impossible situations for man. I don't know if anybody's listening, but I mean, I mean, he, he just seems like he could have said that 40 years earlier or something, you know? <laughs> but, but in the middle of what is ridiculous... Come on, God doesn't mind us saying, you know, this seemed ridiculous to us. Now, if you've never thought that, I don't know what's wrong with you. I mean, this is ri ridiculous. And then the Lord said, you know, no, no, no. He said, no, you're going to have a child. Go come from your own body, you know. 
And Abram at this time is in his 90s. So, he, so Abram was 86. You know, they go on, you know, you know, Sarah comes up with a little idea to give uh, Hagar. You remember all that. I'm going to help God out. You know how that goes. And, you know, okay, so we need an heir, so I'm going, we're, he's going to have a son. But he didn't say by me, blah, blah, blah. Can't you just hear how you just do things? And then so Abram was 86 when, was, when uh, Ishmael was born. And Ishmael was 13 when Isaac was circumcised. So do the math. I mean, when Abram uh, was circumcised, so, so do the math. Now at, no, Isaac, Isaac, excuse me. Now look at verse 6. Of that saying, Then he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Now I want you to see something. There is a key to Abraham's life, and it's two words. Believe God. Amen. I mean, that, that's the, the entire story of Abraham is wrapped up in believe God. Amen. All of it, believe God. Trust what God says and know that if he says it, he'll do it in his perfect time and in his perfect way. Now, if you and I could hang on to that, Father Abraham, that's what he knew that most of us do not know. Amen. He believed God, and that meant to trust God that what he says he will do in God's perfect time and God's perfect way. Amen. Hebrews 11:6 tells us all of this. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Amen. Now, there's no need to seek God without believing that you're going to meet God. That's a way to turn that around. If you're going to spend your time to get on your face and seek God or whatever, and you can't come out of there saying, well, I didn't find him. He didn't show up. No, he said he's a rewarder. But it takes faith believing he's going to meet you. Amen. That's where we mess up. You have to believe, if I'm going to lock myself up and I'm going to do this and I'm going to give my time and full attention, I'm going to put the phone, put it on even put it in the same room and get all this stuff away from me and I'm going to seek God, then there is no way that God's not going to make himself known to me. Amen. That's really what that scripture says. Because he's a rewarder to anybody who seeks him. That's what he does. So after they returned from Egypt, you know, Sarah got the bright idea, you understand, and so that... Uh, that he would give, she would give his, her uh, servant, you know, over to Abram. They would, and he would have relations with her. And then, you know, it's amazing how we ra uh, rationalize things. Sarah wanted to help God out. Has anybody ever tried to help God out? Oh, I've helped him out so many times. But the one thing I can tell you, he never appreciated it. Have you ever been there? I mean, let me, I'm, you know, when you begin to help him out is when you begin to figure it out. When you begin to figure it out, you're helping it out. Because with God, you can't figure it out. So about the time you think you got it figured out, you've moved yourself into helping God. That you ought to write across the tablet of your heart somewhere, because that would be a really good guide. So she wants to help him out. And uh, that, you know, works of the flesh never work. Now, you might want to take note of that. We're going over to chapter seven, uh, 17. He's now 99 years old. Sarah is 89 when the Lord appears to Abram again and renews the covenant, changes Abram's name to Abraham and Sarah's to Sarah. Now, I didn't put this on the screen, but I, I, uh, let me, it's, it's, it's uh, in that chapter, and it talks about this is a word to Sarah. I will bless her. Now, this is God telling Abraham this. Now, keep this in mind. I will bless Sarah. I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings and people shall be from her. Look at Sarah go. Hallelujah. All from Sarah, glory to the Lord. He's, God's going to bless her. She's going to be the mother of nations. I mean, it didn't really seem to matter a whole bunch at that point. Anybody listening? Because we already had a little problem. Abraham laughs. Reminds God that Sarah's almost 90, because he's almost 100, and says, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. 
In other words, Abraham begins to say, you know, we've got this thing figured out, Lord. We figured it out about 13 years ago, and we got this thing figured out, and Sarah and I worked it out. And I have a son already. So we got it covered. I see when you said you were going to give her a son what you really meant through her servant through somebody that belonged to her, was given to her, that was hers, and she gave her to me so that I could have a relationship with her. So we got the boy. So this is Abraham, you know, telling God how we've got it worked out. In other words, God, don't, don't worry yourself anymore about it. You don't, you don't need to worry about this. This is taken care of. And, and the thing that's interesting, Ishmael is 13 years old. Now, when somebody's 13 years old, and, and, and they're yours. I mean, emotions are everywhere. I mean, today, I guess we'd have the, we'd be calling in the facts uh, to Abraham. Oh, you'll get it later. Mm -hmm. You'll get it later. Anyway, so we've got affection here, and we've got all kind of stuff. I mean, they're tied in, they're together, da-da-da-da. This is my son. And, Abra and Abraham is actually saying to God, I'm perfectly happy with the plan we've gotten. Right. I like it. He's, I mean, this is my son, 13 years. I mean, he's my son. And we don't need to do anything else. I mean, now we're really old. That's what he's really saying. But I, it appears that Abraham failed to miss something. He missed it one time before, and this is what he missed, maybe more than one time. It appears that Abraham failed to notice that for the past 13 years, ever since the birth, Beth, the birth of Ishmael, God had been silent. He hadn't said a word. Now, I hope you're listening, because Abraham got, got so caught up in his plans and his son who need to hear from God? I mean, I had what God said I was going to have, a son. Why don't you look at your own life and see if you might find out something that may be going on? You're so caught up in what you worked out and how you've made things happen and how you refuse to go by this or go by that and the other and you think you've got it all handled and you've come up with your plan. You, you have not even missed God talking to you. Oh, you need to really be thinking. Abraham was so in amber, so caught up, so, oh, glory to God, I got an heir, I got my son, 13 years Oh, hallelujah. He did not even recognize that God hadn't said a word in 13 years. Who needs God? We worked it out. And we worked out what he said. We got a son. Take note, disciples. Hope you're listening. Then we can chapters 18 and 19, we get a, a picture of the result of the decisions that were made. Psalms 1, verses 1 and 2. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Abraham made some mistakes, friend. He was fearful at times, and he was foolish, foolish to lie with, with Hagar. But his heart, and this is what God pays attention to, Amen. but his heart, his life, and his commitment was after God Almighty. He's a prototype of those people who live by the Spirit. And uh, Lot is a prototype of those who live by the flesh. There was a great Christian writer who said this, if you put first things first, the second things will always fall into place. Amen. But if you seek second things first, you will gain neither the second nor the first. Amen. Amen. Did you get that or do I need to read it again? If you put first things first, the things of God, if you put God first, the second things will always fall, always fall into place. But if you seek the second things first, you will gain neither the second nor the first. So God chooses those whose heart is with him, who love his word, and though they fail at times, are quick to repent 
and get on with loving and serving God. So on the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Now, he was telling you that, uh, that all the things that the unbelievers worry about should not be a concern of ours. And we don't even know how to process that. But that's what he was saying. And then he said, where you'll live, what you'll wear, uh, your next meal, all of that are things that are in the hands of your Heavenly Father if you'll just trust Him. He's not going to leave you. Amen. I won't leave you. I won't forsake you. Now, now get this. All of that was an introduction. Now, now I'm ready to go to the message. Okay. Y'all ready? Y'all with me? All right. So, we've just been set up for chapter 18 and 19 of Genesis. Abraham, let me repeat, Abraham is the only person in all of Scripture, the only one called friend of God. Three times in the Bible, Abraham is referred to as God's friend. Second Chronicles 27. Did you not, O our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? Isaiah 41, 8. But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, descended of Abraham, my friend. James 2.23. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Now, I want to be a friend of God. Anybody else want to be a friend of God? Yeah. I mean, I want to be, I mean, not just... Sing a song, I'm a friend of God. I want to be a friend of God. Amen. So let's go to chapter 18 and pick up with verse 1. Now the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. This is Abraham. While he lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, three men were standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a piece of bread that you may refresh yourselves. After that, you may go on since you have visited your servant. And they said, So do as you said. So Abraham heard into the tent to Sarah and said, quickly, now listen, he's going into Sarah. Dude, we're not young here. So Abraham rushed into the tent to Sarah and said, quickly prepare three measures of fine flour and knead it and make bread cakes. Abraham also, remember he's got 318 servants. Abraham also ran to the herd, took a tender and choice calf and gave it to the servant and he hurried to prepare it. He took curds and milk and of the calf which he had prepared and placed it before them. And he was standing by them under the tree as they ate. So he didn't even sit at the table with them. Then they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, they're in the tent. And he said, I will surely return to you at this time next year. And behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door which was behind him. And Abraham and Sarah were old. Advanced in age, Sarah was past childbearing. Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I become old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I indeed bear a child when I am so old? You better watch what you say in quiet. And if you think God's not listening, I just thought I'd just throw that in. Is anything too difficult for the Lord? Now, if you really look at that, it really says, is anything too difficult for the Lord? But, but one of the Hebrew translations says, is anything too wonderful for the Lord? So is anything too difficult or is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you at this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah denied it, however, saying, I did not laugh. For she was afraid. And he said, oh, but you did laugh. No, but, but you laughed. Now, now notice this. We're going to go through these scriptures, so to speak. Now notice that he, was, he appeared to Abraham when he was sitting at the tent of the door at the heat of the day. Now, 
that's not, you know, nobody would expect anybody to be coming in the heat of the day. I mean, it could very easily be 120 degrees out where they were. But if you're going to be God's friend, you're going to be God's friend. This is number one. Number one. The Lord will show up suddenly. So let me put it this way. If you're going to be God's friend, you have to be constantly ready for suddenlies of God. We're talking about how, how is it, what do I have to do to be a friend? You've you got to be comfortable with suddenlies, suddenlies of God. Now, you know, we, we're so prone. We plan our lives. We do this. We, we set up our expectation. We get frustrated. Everything doesn't go the way we want it to. Moses experienced a suddenly when he saw the burning bush. We experienced a suddenly with the ark. For those of us who are believers, a suddenly happened. Isaiah experienced a suddenly when a vision of the throne room appeared before him. Paul certainly had a major suddenly on the road to Damascus. And there are many others in the scriptures that, you know, we just can't talk about all of them. But friends of God expect the unexpected. Amen. <laughs> friends of God, they expect God to do something. Amen. They expect God to burst in those scene. They expect God just to do something. They're looking for a suddenly. Looking for a suddenly. Friends of God are comfortable with suddenlies. Might not understand it at the moment, but you don't, you know, fall apart. Nor do you take it upon yourself that you have to explain the suddenly. Amen. You just rejoice in the suddenly. Amen. So when the king of the universe comes calling to us, his friends don't worry about anything. Uh, they just drop everything. I want to hear what God has to say. I don't care what else is going on. And that friends of God look for God. They look for God to show up. And when God's about to show up and, and, and you see something begin to move, I mean, everything else, I mean, Throw the, you know, the phone out the door and the TV out the door too. God's about to say something. Amen. So suddenly has come. So friends of God are never too busy to stop whatever they're doing when the Lord has something to say. Early on in Abraham's life, he hesitated to follow God. You know that. And over time, he learned to lean completely on the Lord. And he had one of the most outstanding suddenlies that you and I could we can't even comprehend it to this day. That's when the suddenly came that, you know, about take Isaac, your son, after Isaac was born, you know, and take Isaac and slaughter him, offer as a sacrifice your son. That was a suddenly. Scripture says, so Abraham rose early, in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him, and Isaac, his son. He didn't procrastinate. He did, it appear, hesitate. Now, you and I, we'd be saying, you know, we just need to have a conference. I mean, we need to see about this. I mean, this, this you know what you'd be saying? Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> I know that I know this could not be God. I prayed too many years, and God supernaturally showed up and told me and Sarah in an impossible situation that we were going to have this son. This cannot be God telling me to give back my son that he supernaturally gave to me. It can't be God. Have you ever done anything like that? Dear God, I have. I have. And you know what we do? We reason it. Yes. As if we can reason out the things of God. Y'all, you can't do it. Yes. You know, I find at this age of my life, I've just said, you know, I just don't know. I don't understand. I don't know. No need to ask me. I don't know any more than you do. I just trust God. Amen. Well, that's exactly. Abraham, it looks like he didn't hesitate. He heard, he, it look, the Bible says he got up early in the morning. It appears the next day. He got up early in the morning to obey what he'd been told to do. A friend of God hears and obeys the suddenly of God. I'm still on suddenly. I'm still on number one. He obeys the suddenly. Now, you know what, I can, you know what you and I do? 
you know, if, if, if we want somebody to call and tell us they're coming to our house. We don't want no suddenly drop-ins. We don't want no suddenly drop-ins. We want time to, you know, to get all the things cleaned up and wash the dishes, make up the bed, get everything off the floor. We don't want no suddenlies. I mean, if you are really, really a good friend, then we'll go with it. But we just don't want anybody. Am I telling the truth? Yes. You know, but Jesus, <laughs> if he is our bestest friend, if he's our friend, then we don't, we don't care. I have so many people have said to me, because the Lord had talked, how many of y'all the Lord talked to you in the shower? The Lord talks to me in the shower. I never forget years ago, years ago when I made that statement, years ago, down on Walter Way, he said, the Lord talked to me in the shower. Somebody came up to me, you should not be saying that. <laughs> and I said, why? <laughs> well, you're in the shower. You're a woman. I said, what? Do you think God didn't know it? <laughs> what? I said, with God, I'm not. With God, he talks spirit to spirit. God is a spirit. He didn't talk to a woman or a man. That was one of the greatest revelations God ever taught me. It freed me to preach. So when God called me, he did not call a woman. God is the Father of spirits. He called my spirit man. My spirit. God don't come to talk to your flesh. I mean, let's get over that. God doesn't knock at your door, you know, to, to talk to your flesh. He does not. He is a spirit. He is the father of spirits. So he communicates with your spirit. Oh, if the church would wake up and quit being dumb. I don't even know what else to say. So to be a friend of God is to be comfortable with his suddenlies in your life. Ready to welcome him at any moment. Respond to whatever he says. Even if it means you've got to change your plans and get on with the program. Now, this is important, you know, because in that first verse of chapter 18, 1, it says, I'm just going to read it to you again. Now, the Lord appeared, and it's capital letters, L-O-R-D. Every time you see Lord, it's not always capitalized in your Bible. Sometimes it is, and I'm fixing to tell you why. We're in the south, so I'm fixing to do it. Now, all right. Now, it's important for you to know that the word Lord, capitalized, Lord, in this verse actually means Yahweh. The name of God that is always used in Scripture when God wants to, con to convey His absolute integrity and faithfulness. It's the name that says, I will always do what I have said I will do. Amen. No matter what it looks like. Now, you need, you need, to, be, you need to be listening this season this season. I will always do what I said, no matter what things look like. It's the name that says, I'm all you need. We sing this song. He's all we need. Well, he truly is. Yes. He's all we need. Jesus is all we need. So anytime, anytime when you're reading the Word of God and you see the word Lord capitalized in your Bible, all in caps, it, it, it's always this name, the God that can be counted on. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So, in Genesis 18, three visitors approach Abraham. And, and uh, I, I was going to read that again, but I think not. I think I'm just going to go on. Because it said he lifted up his eyes and looked. Do you remember, you remember that? Well, maybe we will read it again. Yeah, I want you to see it. Read it. Uh, go back to uh, Genesis 18. Genesis 18, 1, I mean, 2 through 5. Genesis 18. I've probably confused them. Genesis 18, this is a suddenly. Genesis 18. Genesis. <laughs> Genesis. They, all right, here we go. Now the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. When he lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, three men were standing opposite him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, My Lord, 
If now I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet. And, and uh, I want to go all the way to five. And, and I will bring a piece of bread that you may refresh yourselves that after you may go on since you have visited your servant. And they said, so do as you've said. Now, I wanted you to notice this again. He's sitting in the heat of the day. I talked to you about that earlier, but I didn't, this one part I didn't tell you. I said it was about 120 degrees. But you've got to remember that he's recovering at age 99 from being circumcised. So at this time that, that these three show up, he's recovering from circumcision, sitting in the heat of the day, sitting out. He looks up, three men standing at short distance away, and clearly one of them is the Lord, you know, Jesus in the Old Testament, the pre-incarnate Jesus, you know, the epiphany of Jesus. And the other two appeared in the form of men. We did a, there's, we did a teaching including them on cloud of witnesses, went in detail about that, whether they're angels or whether they are cloud of witnesses, that's not the point. That, so they disguised as travelers on their way to Sodom, and, but on the way, the Lord, they stopped by to speak to Abraham. Now, Abraham knew and discerned that one of them was the Lord. Abraham bows to the ground before him and offers hospitality to them, which is an Eastern cultural thing to do. But it also gives characteristic number two of somebody who's going to be a friend of God. The second clue, if you're going to be a friend of God, you must embrace humility. You must embrace it. Now, Abraham's 99 years old. He's recovering from circumcision. Very wealthy. He's got three, plus 300 and something servants. But the thing that's interesting about it is that he, at this point, he bows down to the three. You would think they'd bow down to him. At that point, him not recognizing immediately that they would bow down to him because he's wealthy. But no, Abraham, Abraham knew his place. He knew he was a servant. Amen. This is one of the problems in the church. Amen. And that's, I, I'm, because of the things I'm telling you, I, it made me understand why I always kind of just went like this when we were saying, I, I'm a friend of God. Because I knew we all weren't friends of God. That's it. Well, I, just the things I'm naming to you. We all don't deal with suddenly very well. I mean, like the suddenly that just happened to us. Some of you falling in the floor, still rolling over. No need. Then we aren't servants. If you're going to be a friend of God, you have to have a servant's heart. You, 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 and, and a servant is humble. Humility. And I know that all of us don't. A lot of people think they should be waited on, but they should not wait on anybody. They think they should have the best seat, the best parking place. They should be honored more than anybody else. They should blah, 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 blah. And honey, when you're stuck on yourself like that, forget the humility. You ain't got it. You with me? So he wasn't, he, you know, he didn't expect anything. You know, I mean, Abraham, he knew his place. We knew he had humility because he let Lot pick the land. He didn't have to let Lot. He could have just said, Lot, you go on over there, brother, and do the best you can do. But all of this, God promised to me. He didn't promise it to you. He didn't promise one bit to you. None. He didn't have to give it to him. Humility. Now, listen to what God declares through Isaiah. Isaiah 57. For thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy. I dwell on a high and holy place, and also with the contrite and lowly of spirit, in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Now, humility is not thinking. You need to write this one down. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. I'm going to say it good. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. Amen. You're not the first one on your list Amen. for everything. Amen. Now, 
Humility is nothing but truth, and pride is nothing but a lie. Well, I'll just move right on. So the friend of God is deeply aware of his or her own inadequacy, and just as deeply aware of the Lord's all-sufficiency. You had to put the two together. You know you can't do it without him, but you know with him you can do it. There's a lot of people who know they can't do it, but they forget that, yeah, oh, yeah, with God, I, oh, yeah, he can do it. If I get me out of the way, God can do it. But if I stay in the way, nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen. See, I know, and I've learned the hard way, I, I know, I don't, I would be horrified at this stage. I mean, I so look forward to God showing up and helping me. I know I can't do it without him. Now, there was a time in my life, oh, I, I, I could, I mean, I've been preaching a long time. I could go, I could do this, I could do that. I know how to put a, a, a sermon together. I know how to do this and how to do that. But everything I thought I knew, I now know I don't know. And everything I did know was wrong. And so... Each week, I'm on the edge of my seat, wondering, what in the name of God, what in the world? What, a, what? I could not do a series. It would be impossible. I do not know how people do it. I could not do a series unless the Lord came and literally said, now, okay, this is what we're going to do. He told me that about some parallels and about some things back in December at, you know, as, we, as we looked at some things. But... The city is that, well, I think I'll just do this. This is what we're going to be teaching on for about the next month or so. I'm just, my hat's off to anybody that can do it. I'm just telling you, for me, I couldn't do it if I had to. At this stage of my life, at this stage of my life, people say, oh, you got it in you. You know you can do it. You know what? I scream back at them. No, I don't. No, I can't. I don't want day-old bread. I want fresh bread. Now, I've served some day-old bread, and I mean, you know, confession is good for the soul. And some day-old bread's been better than some bread that I've eaten. <clears throat> but anyway. <laughs> or that I've listened to in times gone by. Hallelujah. I'm just being honest. No. Lord God, please don't leave me to myself. Please don't leave me. Please don't leave me. Don't leave me to myself. I know I can't do it without you. It's, it's horrifying to me. Amen. I'm telling the God's truth. Amen. It is horrifying to me. I mean, it sounds like a lie, but it's the God's truth. I've never been more, oh, God, don't leave me Amen. ever in my life, ever, ever. Humility also creates a generous and forgiving heart. And we saw that through what he did with Lot. You know, in Luke 18, I'm not putting it on the screen, it says the Pharisees, remember the Pharisees said, oh, I thank you, God, that I'm not like other men, robbers, evildoers, and adulterers. I don't think you see much humility there. Abraham had the wisdom not to take himself too seriously. He never thought he was indispensable to God's plan for mankind. He knew he wasn't. And let me publicly say this all over the world, anybody who wants to listen. This church will go on fine if I'm not here. I am not this church. I've been honored to be the pastor. But no, this church was built by God, not Sandra Kennedy. God named it. Gave the mandate, put it in order, bought the land, put it all together, designed it architecturally and every other way. I did not do it. And after all of these years, if I hadn't taught somebody and through it all, if God has not nudged somebody around me who has been willing to sacrifice and give, then I have not been successful. So no, whole life, no, I am not, as people think, I am not whole life ministries. 
I'm the shepherd of whole life ministries. And it's one of the greatest joys of my life. But no, I am indispensable. Now, to be clear, that there, there, there is such a thing as hypocritical <laughs> humility. Pretending to be humble so somebody will think you're humble. We know those folks. And, you know, then you've got that crowd that's proud of their humility. I mean, that just don't get it. You know, that's trying, like, to make a hot snowball. <laughs> You'll get that later, too. <laughs> so, appearing to be humble before men in order to impress them is the safest kind of pride because most people won't see through it. I'm going to say that again because you need to hear it. I've been here and done this. I don't know why today's my confession day, but yours is coming. <laughs> Appearing to be humble before men in order to impress them is the safest kind of pride because most people won't see through you. But you're a fake. And you're a hypocrite. You can be sure the Pharisees, when they sent their disciples trying to trap Jesus, he taught them up front, be humble, act humble. And what did Jesus say? You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? That was sweet Jesus' answer. When Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up with his train filling the temple, the prophet didn't say, wow, look at me. I must be something special. I wonder how many others seen the train fill the temple. Glory to God, I had a vision. No. You know what Isaiah said? Woe is me. Woe is me. Humility is the appropriate response to the goodness and kindness of God. Yes. Paul wrote, what do you have that you have not received? In other words, everything you have, God gave you. So the greatest freedom is having nothing to prove and no need to impress or compete. Amen. I don't have a thing in the world to prove. You should think I did. I don't have any need to impress anyone. I just want the Lord to be happy. And I don't have to compete, hallelujah. I just want to know, Jesus, do you like what I'm doing? Are you pleased with how I did this? Did I present your word the way you meant for me to do it? Did I tell it? The way you gave it, did I do it right? That really matters to me. Far more than how you received it. Amen. Number three, Abraham served his visitors. So if you want to be God's friend, first thing we said, you've got to constantly be available to him for suddenlies. Number two, you've got to be humble. Number three, you've got to have a heart to serve others. See, the life of, 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 of a friend of God is wrapped up in so, serving other people. Why? Just because you like to serve. The joy of serving. You don't care if you're recognized. You don't care if you sit in the back row, front row, middle row. You don't care where your seat is. You don't care if somebody sits in it. Even if you bought it. You don't care. You don't care if you're appreciated, overlooked, praised, or taken for granted. You just... Don't get all puffed up like a toad. Amen. You don't. You're just glad God let you in the building. Amen. Amen. And a friend of God is focused on serving the Lord. Jesus came to serve, not to be served. But when he comes back, he ain't coming back as no little wimp of a servant. Amen. He's coming back king of kings and lord of lords. Whoa. And he was the greatest servant Amen. that the world will ever know. Amen. Or have, and he still is a servant in, in a sense of the word. He's always serving his people. That's who he is. That's just who he is. Abraham's 99, like I said, he didn't have to jump up. Abraham didn't have to jump up and go get the cow, the calf. He didn't have to do it. He could have sent somebody. 
He didn't have to do it. He was eager. He wanted it. The Bible says he jumped up. Abraham, it says he hurried to the tent. He ran to the herd. And he hurried to prepare it. That's what the scripture said. Abraham, I know what I would have done. Same thing you'd be done. Joe, you do this. Sally, you do this. And you do that. Go get it. And I'm going to sit in here and entertain. I've done it a thousand times. Haven't you? An opportunity had presented itself to Abraham to show hospitality, and he took it, man. Friend of God, friend of God, does not try to get out of being humble and serving others. I think Abraham understood something that perhaps most of us don't. He knew that serving others was serving the Lord. And he hurried to do it. It says that there was, years ago, that there was a sign put out in a, a plaque near a, a couple, a young couple's door, and it said, let every guest be received as Christ. Amen. Don't we all have Jesus in us? Yes. Yes. I remember Brother Hagin saying one time, with a, you know, with a, talking to a husband and wife, and particularly talking to the husband that was being so negative and complaining so much about what the wife was doing and all, and Brother Hagin looked at him and said, you know, why, and the Lord had said, why are, you, why are you treating me that way? And the husband said, I'm not treating you that way. Well, yeah, I live in her. Amen. I live in her. I live in him. Why are you treating me that way? Amen. Well, I didn't get too many amens on that one. We'll just keep moving. Hallelujah. Abraham wanted to give the best. You know what else he didn't do? He didn't, he didn't say to Sarah, do we have any leftovers? <laughs> we got three sundays that showed up in the yard. Could you please go see if there's any old, anything in the, any stew back here, anything we can pull out real fast to give them? No, he gave the very best he had. He picked the finest and the best. Yes. Bread cakes, fine flour, meat of a young calf. And... Abraham did not sit at the table. He stood over to say, he's 99, just been circumcised. He's standing there as a servant. What else can I do for you? Anything else you need while y'all are eating? He did not even put himself at the same table with him. He remained in the position of a servant. Number four, if you're going to be God's friend, you must settle deep in your heart the issue of who God truly is. Genesis 18, 9 through 15. I'm, I'm going to skip that one. We don't need to bring that one back up. It, it really just shows the same thing. See, our problem today is that we figure things out, we reason and we rationalize, and then we think we're being responsible when we do that. I'm going to say that again because that's a big problem. Is that we, we figure things out, we reason and we rationalize, and when we do all these things without seeking God or inviting anybody else or finding out the whys of things, people need to find out why things are the way they are. You think you're being responsible when you do all of that. All the reasoning. We rationalize everything. Abraham couldn't figure this one out, neither could Sarah. At 99, I'm going to have a child. At 90, she, what, what is this? And then you remember the, the, the three that showed up said, where's your wife? Do you think they didn't know where she was? I mean, the Lord was there. He knew where she was. Then he said, well, I'm going to come back in a year and you're going to have a baby. You remember that. Sarah over here, she laughs. She laughs a laugh of unbelief. Yeah. Said, man, she, I just can't believe it. Earlier in chapter 17, you find out that Abraham laughed. He laughed when God promised him a son through Sarah. But if you read the text correctly and really look at it, you find out that his laugh was one of astonishment. 
Wow, it's sort of like Zachariah and Mary in the Old Testament. I mean, they are in the New Testament, but this is the comparison here in the Old Testament. One laughed for one reason, one laughed for another. One was believing, one was unbelieving. One was like, I don't know how you're going to do it, but hey, hey, can't hardly wait. That's Abraham. The Lord heard and said, why did your wife laugh? And then this is the statement which brings us down home to where we are right now. Is anything too difficult for God? Is anything too wonderful for God? See, that's a, that's a question that you're going to have to solve and you're going to have to answer today. Right now. Last week, God asked us, are you persuaded? And we went back, have, are you persuaded? Have you read about this and read about that? And you're persuaded where you're standing and what you're doing? You know what you're doing? All I want when all of this stuff is over and gone and blown over, I just want to be able to face God and say, I was on your side. Amen. That's all I want. That's all I want. I'm talking about voting now. All I want to make, in case you can't figure it out, all I want to be able to say is, I went with your program. I was on your side. No matter what happens, I was on your side. Give me a check mark. I stood with you. Now, if that doesn't matter to you, maybe you better go to the closet. Now, you better put your nose in the carpet. Because we will. Everything we do, there will be an accountability. I don't care what it is. But I sure want to be able to say, I was with you, Lord. No matter what comes out, I'm with you. I want you to know I was with you. As if he didn't know. As if he didn't know. Is anything too difficult for the Lord? God is omnipotent, omnipresent, eternal, perfectly righteous, abounding in loving kindness, creator of the entire universe. Is anything too difficult for God? No. See, faith expressed in trust is the currency of the kingdom. I want to say that to you again. Because I, I want you to get it. Faith expressed in trust. Trust in God. Because your faith don't work. It's, a, it's trust in God. Is the currency of what makes the kingdom work. A friend of God is utterly and irrevocably persuaded. Back to last week. Persuaded. Nothing is too difficult for God. So I'm asking that question today. Nothing. Are you, are you persuaded? Nothing is too difficult for God. Yes. Nothing's over until God says it's over. I don't care what it is. And however he calls it, he calls it. But he has the last word. For whatever reason he has. So the most outrageous or shocking event or circumstance is met with confidence by a friend of God. Amen. May get shaken up for a minute. Let me say it this way. I'm not saying that emotional reactions to things don't exist anymore if you're a friend of God. Yes, these things happen. But what I am saying is that desire is that despite a human reaction to a suddenly or to some unexpected situation, the friend of God is able to quickly choose peace because of his or her intimate relationship with the Lord God Almighty. And whatever is happening, if I'm a friend of God, I trust him. Now when I've done my part, Church, we, we've been doing our part. Amen. So, this is his situation. And I've already told you the example. Abraham and Isaac. Abraham didn't panic. He didn't wring his hands. He didn't pace back and forth. He didn't scream, not fair. 
He didn't do any of that when he said, you know, take Isaac up. He didn't have a temple ta- uh, temper tantrum. He just took his son knowing, knowing. That's going to be a ram in the bush somewhere. Some way, somehow, out of this, my God's going to turn this thing around. For my, see, this is a, see, my good. Can't believe it, but I'm going prepared to do what he said to do. And whatever God does, it's going to be all right. Amen. No wonder Abraham is called the father of faith. Yes. In closing, to be a friend of God is the most wonderful goal to try to achieve, Amen. to aspire to. I want to be a friend of God. Maybe after I've said all that, you can understand why I always got this little something. And maybe it was just me. Maybe I knew I wasn't genuinely, I knew there was something that had more depth to it. I knew there was something that, to call yourself friend of God when it's only, it just, and maybe it had nothing to do with anybody. Maybe God was just talking to me. Sandra, you, you got some tune-up to do. but I would react just a little bit. Confession time again. Oh, I could sing that song now. Because I'm aspiring. I'm, I'm moving. I understand what it means more. And I want more than anything. I want to be a friend of God. I want to be one. I want to be one. So, if I want to be one, how do we get there? Let me go over the four things again. We'll close. The friend of God is comfortable with God's suddenlies. He or she is ready at all times to let God be God. Number two, friend of God is selfless or humble or self-effacing. I mean, they, they, they're not stuck on themselves. Friend of God is a servant trying to imitate Jesus who came not to be served but to serve. Every job in this church at one point I did. I've mopped floors. I've cleaned commodes. I did, every, there's not a job. God is my witness. I do it today. Today, if I go into a restroom in this building, today, if I go in and it's not clean, I look down to get one of those things and I clean it. Today, I still do that. This church chose years ago, years ago, not to hire a company to come and clean it. We have never, ever, 37 years, hired a company to come in every week and clean it before services because the Lord talked to me about the servant that this is our church we built it with him we painted the walls you built the walls you put up the walls you painted it you put up the lights you strung the electricity you did you did everything in this place we didn't lay the carpet and we didn't put in the sprinkler system we did everything. Everything. It's yours. Keep it. You've invested in it. Keep it. See, if you have this tendency to put everything out and let somebody else do everything, if you eventually get where it, it loses value to you. Amen. You'd rather give your money than your time. You, you lose your connection to the place. Amen. Amen. How thrilled it's been through the years to have those who are little kids, little kids when we were doing things here, little kids. We would stop and let them have a broom and do all kinds of stuff. And, and they'd make a bigger mess and we'd have to come clean up what we had just finished. <laughs> but t- 
to this day, some of them have come and said, I helped build this sanctuary. It's ours. We did. To this day, if you're a part of this church, we ask you, please, sign up to come vacuum, clean, do this, wipe this down. If you go in the parking lot and see trash, please pick it up. Don't leave anything on it. Don't stick chewing gum under God's chairs. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't leave your trash around. Don't throw your cigarettes butts in the parking lot. Dear Lord God Almighty. Don't do this. Don't chew your tobacco and spit in our parking lot. This is God's land. This is God's place. To this day, our little dollars that we give, that's just helping us. No, we're not paying anybody. We're doing it ourselves. We're just... We're doing it. We still do it. Now, when I'm gone, if the church is still here, and of course, I think we're all going up in the rapture. I don't know what they'll do. But as long as I'm here, this is what we do. Because it's who we are, because we're thankful that God gave it to us. And I want him to know I honor his sanctuary. I honor his sanctuary. I honor his place. And I don't want it to become just another house of worship. Oh, this one we built. Oh, we built this one ourselves. No, we didn't have a contractor. No, we did not have an architect. No, for any. Couldn't do it now, but we did it then. It's ours. God graced us and let us. He let us. Servants. Servants did it. Servants did it every day. Service did it. And then everybody bring all the food in. We went in tons of food. Everything. You would be astounded if we told it all to you. That's servanthood. We got a generation knows nothing about it. That's number three. Of being a friend of God. Just serving. Just serving. Your position does not make you. I don't care if you own 15 homes and 45 cars. I don't care who you are. To be a friend of God, you've got to be a servant to your brothers and sisters and certainly to his house. See, the deal is, this is his house. We didn't build it because they needed another church in Augusta. God supernaturally appeared and said, do it, and this is the name, and this is what it will look like. And this is your mandate. Grow up the body of Christ. To me, growing up, it's trying to be a friend. Number four, the last one. The friend of God has unshakable trust in the love and integrity of the Lord. So I could put it this way. I just wrote it down. Is anything too difficult for God? Where we are today, where we sit today, is anything? No. Faith expressed in trust is the currency of the kingdom. A friend of God is utterly, permanently, irreversibly, irrevocably persuaded. I am persuaded. That nothing, hear me, I'll shout it, nothing Amen. is too difficult for our God. Amen. And I am going to enjoy watching him. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Did you learn anything? Do we have any people who really want to be friends of God? I want to be a friend of God. If, they, if they're taking snapshots from heaven, look. If the angels got, if you got yourself a camera up there, maybe they've got an iPhone or something. If you, hey, if I could put my feet in the air, put them in there. Hey, I, I, look at me. I want to be a friend of God. I want God to call me a friend. I want God to call me a friend. And I believe where we stand right now, 
till these next 33 days. December 14th, however many days it is. Whatever happens, stand. Amen. It's not my place to make an outcome. It's my place to be faithful. It's my faith place to believe that nothing is impossible with God. And I'll say this. I will say this boldly. You better keep your eye on the eastern sky. You better. We've never lived here like this. You better keep watching the eastern sky. Jesus is coming. And we are in the season and this time right now with what's happening and all that could be happening. It's the most serious time of mine in your life. And we have to pray like we have never before prayed for peace Amen. on earth, goodwill, yeah. to men of goodwill. Amen. We have to pray like we have never prayed because hell is being shook up. Amen. And the church has to stand. Amen. Now, Father God, we thank you and bless you and praise you. You are a wonderful, miracle-working God. Lord, I'm excited. I heard your word. I've seen you do so many impossible things. Oh, my goodness. Impossible to man. Absolutely nothing to you. You live in the supernatural. You are supernatural. That's just who you are. Let us be faithful. Let us be faithful to our calling. Let us grow up. Let us be faithful. Thank you for the army that's changing. This whole CSRA for the glory of Almighty God. We bless you and praise you. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, I'm not asking you to join the church. You ought to. You should. Find your place where you can say, Hey, I'm not just, I'm here and you can count on me. But that's not what I'm asking you to give your life to Jesus. And if you're here today and you've not given your life to him, would you just slip your hand up wherever you might be? Anyone. Out, out, out there all over, wherever. Please open your heart and give your life to Jesus. He loves you. He'll bring peace where there is no peace. He'll help you even like you. Much less ever those, those around you and you'll want with everything in you to tell somebody else about Jesus. Let bygones be bygones. Yet, let yesterday be gone, church. If you're out there watching, open your heart. Say, Jesus, I want you. I believe you're the Son of God. I want you in my life. If you're in this room, God, I want you in my life. We're in dangerous times. You could come back in a second. I want to be ready to meet you. Invite him into your life. In this church today, invite Jesus. Don't go out the door. Invite him into your heart. Give you to him and watch what he'll do for you. Anyone. And let me say to you, if you've got neighbors around, claim them for the kingdom. Claim your streets. Claim them in your prayer life, claim them, walk down, you know, point them out. Oh, I claim you, I claim you. They don't have to hear you, I claim you for the kingdom of God. Let something about your life be so tender somebody wants to be like you. These are serious days. Come and be a part of what we're doing. Please be here tomorrow night. We are, I mean, we're nowhere near done. We are nowhere near done. We're nowhere near done. And I, I, I will just, let me, let me say this. I, I, I'm already up here, Brother Horace, so I'll just go ahead. That Wednesday is Veterans Day, so we want to honor them. We do honor our veterans. We always have. There's a Zoom meeting on Tuesday for the men. Exciting. Thanksgiving orders. You can place your order. You can go ahead and place your order. Got to the 18th. Honey from the Rock Cafe is doing all the wonderful vegetables and desserts and things and you can 
you can call the church office. They'll move you, bump you over to the, the right people. Live streaming every single day next week, 1230, 1230. I took them off of mine, but I hope I can remember them all. And I know Sarah Fer Ferguson, good report. She's expecting to come home this week. Yeah. Hallelujah. See who else is on there. We wrote them in after I got here. Barbara Hightower, Barbara, we found out that your mother went home to be with the Lord on Friday. I saw Barbara, where are you? Yes, yes, yes. And JJ continues to need a supernatural miracle. Is anything too hard for God? No, and we will not back down from standing with our brothers and sisters in, in Christ. Amen? Amen. Now, I'm going to ask you, uh, let's just stand. I'm going to take the, the ark. We're going to, guys, if y'all will come sit the, I mean, sit the ark, I'll take the rod. If you'll come and put it down on the floor, I appreciate it. So anybody who's here who wants to come by and see but I'm going to ask the Lord God Almighty the rod of Aaron this is rod of somebody some Aaron uh, I'm asking God to let the truth saturate us unless it was used as a rod of authority against plagues and all kind of things that would come. And we, we use it that same way. God is the one that can make supernatural things happen. And I just believe, I believe, I lift the rod up. You know, somebody snuck in and put it in there and called me a hoax or whatever. I can't wait to... God strengthens them up, hallelujah. <laughs> but I'm a believer. I'm a believer. I will not be caught not believing a suddenly, however, whatever. And so I use it like Rod, like Aaron. We come against plagues in Jesus' name. We come against it. We push back darkness. We come against sickness and disease. We hold it against the camera. I'm looking for my camera. Where's my camera? come against sickness and disease for those of you out there who are watching we come against I pray that God himself will walk into your house Give me, let me stay with the camera that God himself will walk into your house and touch you from the top of your head to the soles of your feet and we come against and break sickness and disease off of you and life you we need you for this season the most important time in history for America is from now to inauguration, now to electoral college. We need you strong and healthy, and we break Satan's power over you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And Lord, we give you glory, and we give you praise in the name of the Lord God Almighty. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. If you have not seen, then you may come. And they'll put a glass over it and you may look. Just put that down in the corner. Thank you. And the guys will, our priest will be here for you. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Let me say this as we get ready to go. Surely you know that giving a dollar on Sunday morning is not your tithes. Amen. I mean, if you don't know more than that, you need help. Amen. We have never taken up offerings except to give them away through all the years. We've had guests we took up offerings, but for 37 years, we have never took an offering except to give it away. Because the Lord told me when he visited me, 73, 83, 73, 80, 83, when he visited me, Put in the back of the church. And there it is, right back under the sound booth. Put it there. Teach your people to give their offering. You know to give your offering. You know what a tithe is, 10% of what. That's just a tithe. That's just the beginning. Give. I count on you to give. 
at your convenience, just come and give. People come in during the week just to give, just to give, just to give. Give. Right back in the back, a little, right there by the sound booth, there's a little tithes and offerings box. You know to do that. And so I, 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 we count on you to do it. We count on you to do it. I've been told over the years, God knows how many times, quit doing that, quit doing that, you'll never get any money, you'll never get any money. Well, we've never been in the red, I mean, I mean must be doing pretty good and we look at it, hallelujah. And nor will we this year. Amen. Stand with me. We will not let COVID make us go into the red for the first time in our life because we are givers. Amen. And you give in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Most High God. Miss Barbara, will you close this in prayer? Father, we thank you for your marvelous presence with us today. We thank you for your word, which brings life. We thank you, Lord, for every person here and every person out there watching on live streaming. We pray your blessing as each one goes their way, that the sense of your presence would remain with us that we'd become more and more aware of your presence with us every moment. And we thank you for your overwhelming kindness to us. We give you praise, we give you thanks. We lift up our president and those in authority over us as your word tells us to do and we pray your blessing upon them today. In the name of Jesus, we exalt you Lord. Be lifted up and honored in this nation. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all.